A new study says contracting cancer may be less about lifestyle and more about sheer bad luck. The study claims that random mutations in DNA cells are responsible for two-thirds of adult cancers. Every second of every day, stem cells in our body divide. Sometimes a mutation occurs when this happens. When it does, a cancer can form. Many believe cancer is down to bad lifestyle, obesity or smoking. But a new study in the United States reveals that the overwhelming majority are down to sheer bad luck. So let's put this into perspective. Two thirds of the cancer types studied could be explained by these bad luck mutations. These include brain tumours, bone cancer and pancreatic cancer. These remaining nine were linked to environmental or inherited genetic factors and include skin cancer, lung cancer and cancer of the colon. Professor Jane Plant, a leading geochemist, has been diagnosed with cancer seven times. She's worried this study gives out the wrong message. You know, people have shown obesity is a major factor. They have shown that um, lack of exercise is important, diet's important. There are all sorts of things we can do to cut our risk and they're implying that these things are not important. Even though two-thirds of cancers are seemingly random, doctors are united in one thing, that a healthy, balanced lifestyle is still the best way to reduce the risk of getting cancer. I stress, I do think that pharmaceuticals and things have a role to play, but as we need a much more holistic approach, diet, exercise, stress, all those things are very important. So why do I think I know anything about cancer? 26 years ago this year, I was in Canada um, doing all sorts of things at an international conference when I discovered a lump in my left breast. Being British, I stayed and did all the things I was supposed to do, like chairing sessions, giving keynotes, but came back to the UK and had a left radical mastectomy. There was a single tumour. It hadn't spread to the lymph nodes. Just go away, forget it, and enjoy my life. Well, being me, I couldn't do that, so I was fishing around for things I could do to help myself. And to everybody's amazement, this lump started to itch and shrink, and within six weeks, it had gone completely. And I was totally cancer-free for... 18 years, and then my husband kept saying, Jane, there's a funny lump growing on your chest. And by the time I went to my oncologist, it was 80 square centimetres. And what had I done? I'd become very lax. I'd been eating falafel in the Imperial College canteen, not realising it contained powdered dairy. Or oh, the odd egg sandwich with butter isn't going to hurt me. And so I had become incredibly lax because I was obsessed with a book I was writing called Pollutant Human Health and the Environment. And I went on my strict diet, my plant programme, one diet, and within three weeks, this 80 square centimetre lump was down to 36 square centimetre lump. And within a, a, about three months, it had gone totally. So um, I believe very much that diet is one of the main factors in, um, in cancer. I think the, Chinese, the old Chinese diet was so good. You know, and um, of course it was investigated in the 1980s by Colin Campbell, Chen Junsi, and um, oh, um, a professor from Oxford, um, Sir Richard Peter, and they actually documented the difference between the Chinese and the Western diet. And basically the Chinese were having far more carbohydrates, unrefined, far less fats, um, alcohol about the same, interestingly, protein about the same, but the Chinese were having something like, I think it was almost 95%
vegetable protein, whereas the Western diet is about the same amount of animal protein. So they documented a lot about the Chinese diet. Fortunately, they did, because we wouldn't be able to spot much of a difference now. I actually worked on the problem where all around our coast, gastropods such as um, dog whelks and um, oysters were being wiped out. So the normal little animals at the top changed into those squiggly, funny, uh, orangey coloured ones at the bottom because all the female oysters' egg tubes had become blocked because they were affected by a chemical called organotin. Hermaphrodism in frogs uh, caused by a very common um, herbicide called atrazine, used particularly on corn crops in the States. And in this country, we kept getting stories about fish feminization. And it wasn't until 1993 that Theo Colborn, the very distinguished biologist from Florida, came up with the term endocrine disruption. And since then, this research has taken off. Plasticizers like pharmaceuticals, uh, female contraceptive pills, all these chemicals were causing this hormone disruption. So one of the things that's very important is to try to help people avoid that. Uh, plastics are dreadful, and my dentist keeps trying to stuff all sorts of plastics in my mouth, and I keep sending them away, and I, I will only have gold or ceramics. Um, UV screens, PCBs, wonder chemical of the 70s, they're still around, and brominated flame retardants. I mean, I could go on, but just to give you some idea of, of what we've done. This is George Monbiot in The Guardian. Academics in the media have failed dismally to ask the crucial question of scientists' claims. Who's paying you? Who's paying for your research? Well, I can say, quite honestly, nobody to do with cancer or food. I work for the mining industry, making sure their environmental performance is up to speed. So it's OK for me, but so often you hear somebody on the BBC and you say, John Humphreys, why don't you ask this person? George Monbiot raised this because somebody was on going on about the nanny state, about smoking, and it turned out the man was funded by British American Tobacco, which is why George Monbiot wrote that. I think that um, things only change when you get through to people what the problem is and what some possible solutions are. I don't know really. I, tell, I mean, I, I just, I really want to write a book about the environment, um, and then I think I'll write a, an autobiography. If that's not too self-indulgent, but um, if I do write that book, I'm going to give the last book. I'm going to give the proceeds to the Geological Society so they can foster things for women. Because when I first became an earth scientist, the difficulties that women faced were unbelievable. So. Uh, I would want to do that.